Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Uh, today I have the pleasure of interacting with somebody that I've seen on social media, Carnivore JT, goes by Jason. Um, he's got a cookbook, he's got a podcast. And what interested me um, was, you know, a, a story that he posted about a person that he worked with who had, uh, who has cerebral palsy and had a lot of uh, weight to lose. And uh, he felt like he couldn't go low carb and animal based given the budget constraints that he had. And Jason helped him out and he was able to lose an incredible amount of weight and reclaim his life. Now, Jason has his own story that we'll get into. Um, and just a little bit about Jason. He has a, you know, bachelor's in sports uh, medicine, and this is from George Fox. And he also has a master's in sports administration from Delaware. And he has a full-time job of taking care of his kids. I'm jealous. <laughs> and it's nice to have you here. And I, I want to hear about your story, you know, certainly. But this story, you know, about this uh, you know, person who felt like they couldn't get, you know, expensive cuts of meat. And maybe they shouldn't do the diet. And you help them out eating on a budget. Uh, that interested me. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit about that story. Yeah. So I actually, um, my first interaction was, you know, was kind of after he had had lost the majority of his weight, but the, what stuck out to me about the interaction was he had messaged me on Instagram and I don't know if familiar with Instagram, but Instagram, if you are not following somebody likes to hide people's messages, right? They put it in a hidden folder. And I'm OCD about not having notifications. Like if you look at my phone, I have zero notifications on my phone. And so I was going through and I saw it and I was like, okay, that's cool. Like I like, I like getting messages from people. And he started off thanking me about, you know, showing videos of using, I'd just done like a, a carnivore on a budget video. And he wanted to thank me for showing that I used Kroger ground beef um, for people that don't have Kroger. It's one of the largest grocery stores chains in the United States. Um, wanted to thank me for using that because that's all he could afford. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'm glad, you know, somebody is, you know, getting some inspiration from that. And then he went further and was like, you know, I've got cerebral palsy and I'm on a fixed income. And I always felt that maybe I wasn't doing enough because I couldn't afford grass fed, organic, you know, all of that kind of stuff, free range chickens, you know, organic pasture raised eggs, all that kind of stuff. And before I'd even talked to him, like that kind of hit me. I was like, man, like that sucks that there's people out there who feel like maybe they're not doing enough because we have influencers who are out here going, you have to eat grass fed. You have to buy from regenerative local farms. You have to, so that stuff's expensive, right? Like it's super expensive. And so then I started talking to him a little bit more and then he sent me his before and after. And he told me he didn't weigh himself, but it literally looks like, you know, he was 350 pounds in a wheelchair um, started going keto, low carb, intermittent fasting, and dropped down into the you know 180s and lost 200 pounds just by changing his his food choices. And you know what what got you talking to me was I decided to make a post. I was like, hey man, can I share this because like people shouldn't feel this way. If you're feeling this way, then other people are, and they shouldn't feel bad because they can't afford the best quality meats. And so I shared that post and it got a ton of traction, which I thought was super cool. Um, and, you know, so I've been talking to him since then and, and working with him a little bit and he's got a great story. Um, but I just think it highlighted the fact that, you know, buy the best that you can do the best that's available and you don't have to do anything crazy. You just have to make better choices with your food and low carb can be a huge game changer, even for somebody that has you know a disability like cerebral palsy. No, I'm just curious, like what is, you know, I, I want to go into that a little bit. I want to talk about the, uh, 
this concept of uh, you know eating on a budget. I think one of the criticisms I've heard of low carb diets very often is it's very expensive. You know, it's a very expensive way to eat. Um, oh, can you hear me? No, I can. You just cut out for a second. Yeah. I, I wonder what happened. Um, what happened to him to sort of start his journey, how it started, why he started, you know, what was his inspiration? And I'm curious, you know, how did it affect his cerebral palsy? You know? so that's so I, I talked to him a little bit about how he started and he said I had a friend who he's like he looked like a model like he was in super good shape um and so he's like I asked him I'm like what do you do like you know how did how did you get in such good shape and the guy was like yeah I do keto and intermittent fasting like that's really all I do and so his mindset was like okay well if it worked for him then maybe it working for me. Like I can't, you know, go through the same type of exercise regimes that he can. Um, but Hey, I can at least start somewhere. And so that's what he did. He started with intermittent fasting and keto and just crazy changes. Um, as far as the, how that's affected cerebral palsy, I haven't had a chance. Uh, like I mentioned to you before, I, I'm going to have him on my, well, you know, I wonder if, you know, uh, I mean, he's gotta be right. If you take 150 pounds off, you know, or a hundred pounds off, it's got to be more mobile, you know, or at least feeling better. Yeah. And that's, that's the big thing. You know, he said mentally, he feels a ton better. Um, he did mention that, you know, he has more energy, can move around. He's doing more stuff. Uh, he did, you know, talk to me that he was starting, you know, like a, a workout routine. So I don't, I don't know the exacts of all of it, but it really just highlighted to me that you don't have to you don't have to do all this crazy stuff in the gym. Like you don't have to do all this crazy cardio to lose weight. You can literally affect it with your diet and he's the living proof of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta be honest. Uh, you know, it really, you know, really piqued my interest. What it was, it was such a heartwarming story. I want to talk a little bit about um, eating on a budget. You know, I, I've seen a lot of, you know, criticism of low carb eating being very expensive. You know, I've, I've heard that very often, you know, it's very expensive. So I'm wondering, like, what did, what were some of the tips you gave him to eat on a budget or what did you tell him? You know, it, it can be daunting to see people eat like the most expensive cuts and, you know, on, on uh, social media. And, and you, you know, I certainly can imagine that some people, you know, would have this idea that if you can't be perfect, maybe you shouldn't do it. So how did, how did, I'm just so curious how, you know, how you manage that, you know, how you manage that in him and, and what was your advice in terms of, you know, uh, or what, do, what do you do? What's your approach? You know? So yeah, that, that prompted quite a few discussions on it, which I was happy about because there are the people that see the diet and go, you know, they see an influencer who goes, you know, I just got my, my grass fed regenerative um, beef from so-and-so like I'll, I'll, I'll say Sean Baker, right? Like probably one of the most polarizing, um, figures for especially carnivore, you know, posting his, his videos and pictures of the beef that he gets. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But if the average person then goes and looks at those places, they realize that he's spending, you know, 20, $30 a pound for some of these steaks. And you just go, Oh my gosh, that's like the amount of money that you spend if you're going to do that is overwhelming. So that uh, that's, I think the first, right, is you have larger influencers who do that. And they're not saying that you can't eat cheaper, but when that's what they're presenting, the average person sees that and goes, man, that's, that's not sustainable. So my theory has always been, A, eat the best that you can afford, right? Like what's that quote? Um, Perfection is the enemy of good, right? Just because you can't afford to eat grass fed, there's not very many people in this country who can afford to eat thirty dollar a pound ribeyes every day for you know a couple of meals a day. So my suggestion has always been, you know, figure out your local grocery stores. Um, is it the best quality meat? Maybe not. Is it vastly better than all of the other junk that you have been eating for the last twenty years? Absolutely. Uh, and then figure out what day of the week their sales go and the video that he actually responded to was me showing that I'd gotten ground beef for $1.97 a pound, which no, is, is not your normal everyday ground beef. Price. 
Yeah, but you can regularly find it for you know two dollars, three dollars, maybe four dollars a pound, and then you go buy 10, 15 pounds and you freeze it. Uh, or chuck steaks, chuck roasts that you find for you know three, four dollars a pound. Um, holidays are great for roasts, like rib roasts. Uh, got a bunch of those for five dollars a pound, and then you you can either cook them as a roast or break them up into steaks or. So it takes some planning for sure. But when you then start to compare it to the average prices of not eating low carb or not eating, you know, a strict whole food diet, you realize that it's really not that much more expensive when you take into account, you know, calorie density and nutrition density and all that kind of stuff. So those were my main ones. And that's, you know, I wasn't even necessarily trying to talk to him, but he gathered that out of it. And then we've talked since then. And it's, I think it's been a really good opportunity to have a bunch of, you know, larger name influencers jumped on board. Uh, Ken Berry jumped on board on that one. He's like, I think he's the one that posted that quote, the uh, uh, perfection's the enemy of good. He's like, eat the best that you can. And at the end of the day, any beef is better than no beef. So I think it was, it was really impactful to get that out there and let, let the average person know that a, you can shop it cheap enough and B, you don't have to have the best grass-fed organic beef in order to still get health benefit. Yeah, so um, I'm just curious, what other sort of, uh, you know, financial, you know, hacks have you employed, you know, as you've gone on your own journey or that you recommended or you've seen? What are other tips that you've noticed along the way? Um, Once you start, so I'm... I was animal based for quite a while and then I've kind of transitioned into carnivore just as a way to, to see how I feel on it. Um, and what I've noticed is if you take the cost, like if you just look at your steaks, right? Like I'm going to eat steak and then I'm going to compare it to the pasta dish that I used to eat. Yeah. It looks more expensive, but then you take into account the condiments that you're buying on top of it, the sauces that you're buying on top of it. Um, the extra stuff that's going into it, the produce that you're buying and then throwing away, um, you know, any number of things, the, all the supplements that you used to buy beforehand, uh, the energy drinks that you bought, the coffees at Starbucks, the, like, once you actually look at it all in totality, and then you realize that if you go on a pretty simple diet, so what I'm eating right now is beef, um, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, right? So when I eat eggs in the morning, and then have maybe some bacon and then eat steak and then eat ground beef. And that's the totality of what I'm eating. When I actually tally that up compared to, you know, buying the English muffins and then the eggs and then the cheese and then the, you know, the sausage patties for breakfast and then getting a, a coffee at Starbucks and then going out to eat for lunch, you tally that up and you save so much money by sticking you know, to something that's a lot more whole food and, and it doesn't have to just be carnivore. Like you can do it um, low carb in general or animal based. But once you start removing out all of those processed foods, like you'd be surprised where you end up financially on it. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I, look, I, I mean, let's go to the direct hacks. You know, I think you brought up a good one, shopping the sales. Kroger's has some great sales of manager markdowns. Uh, Brian Wiley, one of our health coaches, is, you know, sort of posted on how to hack those um, four ninety nine rib roasts that you mentioned. That's a that's a great price. We just had that recently, actually, for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Stocked up on probably like thirty pounds of it. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of sort of meat that's also you know organ meats often discarded. You know, if you really want to throw that into a you know, slow cooker, you can get some really great tasty dishes. In fact, any of the roasts, you know, you can take a really inexpensive roast and just throw it in a slow cooker. Uh, you know, the, you know, pork can be a little bit more affordable, even chicken, you can throw in the slow cooker. Uh, but even beef, you know, you can take that and um, you get, get a very inexpensive, you know, cut, London broil, whatever's on sale, throw it in a slow cooker, add some salt and some spices and, and you're good. And the other thing is if you're not carnivore, you know, um, you know, frozen vegetables oftentimes can be a little bit more inexpensive and, and frozen berries. If you eat the berries, 
uh, you know, berries can get very expensive, but the frozen ones often go for a lot. So I think if you, you buy, I'm sure you've got a chest freezer or a freezer in the, you know, that's probably the biggest expense is if you get that, then you can save forever, really. Uh, you can keep storing some of those sale items in there. And this way you stock up because the sales come down, you know, every once every month or once every two months, Christmas, you know, uh, Easter, you know, uh, Memorial Day, you know, uh, uh, July 4th, Labor Day. That's about it. Right. So if you stock up on those times, you could save in the long run. And then I think you're absolutely right. Like when you drop the chips, you know, when you drop the, uh, you know, when you're not hungry all the time, snacking all the time, all the granola bars I used to buy, all the cereal boxes I used to buy. I mean, those add up, you know? And uh, so, yeah, the meat is more expensive than a box of pasta. Fine. You know, but I think you're right that there's something to it. And, you know, even other things like going to fast food. You know, if you really want to crush that budget down, you can get, you know, hamburger patties. The McDonald's down the block for me is a quarter pound hamburger patties for a buck fifty. You can get a pound of ground meat for six bucks almost anywhere in the country, like within five minutes. I mean, that's a superpower, you know, and, and Wendy's is about the same. You know, it's about anywhere from a dollar to two dollars, depending on the, the Wendy's you go to for for a hamburger patty. So just think about that. If you get a meal with fries and Coke, like that's 10 bucks, right? You can get two pounds of meat for like 10 bucks. I mean, it's it, it's unbeatable. I mean, if you want cheese, fine. That uh, gets a little more expensive. You want bacon, that gets a little more expensive. But some meat and salt is pretty inexpensive. Um, I actually I actually did a, uh, a post a few days ago, probably about a week and a half ago. Um, that got that got circulated around where I I did I compared that I made a like a monster omelet you know still on on BBB it was you know like four eggs a pound of ground beef bacon and I think I even put like a little hot sauce on top and I tallied it all up and I was like cool here's eighteen hundred calories it was you know two hundred something grams of fat two hundred something grams of protein and no carbs and I was like and I tallied up how much it cost me and it was six bucks. And then I went to, I was like, all right, there's got to be a, a fast food meal that that matches this. And sure enough, I went to uh, Burger King and found a double Whopper. That was the exact same amount of calories, about 60 grams of protein, uh, like 250 grams of carbs, and it was 13 bucks. And I'm like, the, the, that's literally just how many people go out. And I've seen people post about Chipotle. They're like, I bought this at Chipotle for 18 bucks. And I'm like, what like food is so expensive now when I go out I don't really go out ever anymore but you know paying fifteen dollars for a a fast food meal that's absolutely just laden with crap versus cooking at home like you can save so much more money and get so much more bang for your buck well I mean even at Burger King right so even at Burger King it's you know, a dollar for two ounces and it's a dollar fifty for four ounces. So or dollar sixty for four ounces. So you could get, you know, eighteen hundred calories. That's roughly if we're gonna do the calories which I don't like doing, about two hundred and fifty calories a patty. So we're talking about, let's see, uh, seven patties, which is a pound three almost two pounds of meat, which is like less than ten bucks. Yeah. Right. You can actually get it cheaper. You get the same amount of energy, be more full and pay less. You know, if you just get I even at Burger King. So uh, a little more expensive than six dollars for the eggs and the, you know, all that. Um, but uh, I'm a, I'm 100 percent on board. I got to see that infographic when you you know, when you when you I'll, I'm I'll send it to you. <laughs> I'll that. Maybe I'll, I'll repost it. So, you know, any other tips for like budget? eating that you've employed you know maybe you said you had two kids at home they got to mm -hmm. be eating similarly to you so you're growing a you're growing a you know you're you're growing some young boys girls what do you got two little boys uh boys. So just turned you know, three and five yep yeah, so they're starting to eat some steaks so you know what does the missus eat what do the kids eat and how do you you know how do you you budget for your family so still trying to get the kids 
closer to my type um, of diet. It's a little difficult. They're a little picky, which anybody with little kids can know. Um, the wife eats similar, but not as low carb. So she'll eat, still prioritizes meat, but we'll eat uh, potatoes, rice, fruit, that kind of stuff. Um, the big thing with the boys is, you know, trying to get them off as much processed foods as possible. Like that's my main goal. Um, I've gone back and forth with a couple of people on, on kids and low carb. I'm not trying to put them into a box of a diet. I'm trying to get them to eat. Um, I don't restrict them eating fruit. If they want to eat fruit, great. Um, as far as budgeting it, it kind of just goes the same way where, yeah, I'm looking for sales. I shop Costco a lot like love Costco. Um, especially since not everything's cheaper at Costco. Like I really don't, I don't buy most of my meat at Costco, but you know, you can find, like you were saying, the frozen fruits, the frozen berries for way cheaper. Yeah. The meat uh, there, I've never seen it below. Like it's always around eight, $9 a pound. Even their sirloin is like six bucks a pound. Their ribeyes and strip steaks are eight, $9 a pound. Typically the eggs I'll buy the Greek yogurt. I'll buy, yeah. you know, um, but I agree with you. Not much other berries I'll buy, you know, berries are usually pretty cheap and pretty good. They got some keto products if that's, you know, what somebody wants to do, but I'm, I, I love Costco, you know, I got no, yeah. they're not, they don't pay me just so everybody knows. I don't have any Costco stock in my retirement account, but um, they certainly help my patients get what they need, you know, and the, the, the fish is pretty cheap. The salmon I think is affordable there. It's usually, mm -hmm. Eight dollars a pound. Sometimes as low as six dollars a pound, which is pretty good for salmon. Yeah. So I mean, it's kind of having once you start doing it long enough, you kind of understand what stores are going to have better deals. Um, and then you just I, I think the biggest thing for shopping on a budget is just having a game plan. Like I think there's nothing worse than either going to a store with no food and hungry, or you know trying to make food at home. And not have anything available. So you grab the first thing of crap that's still left over. And then, you know, you start getting into, like you were saying, like the chips and the chips add up. And now all of a sudden you're not just paying for, you know, the meat and the eggs that they're eating. It's, you know, all the other stuff that goes with it. So as far as budgeting, like it's that that's the main. It's just being conscious of, you know, when stuff goes on sale, always trying to have like a little bit of a stockpile so I don't feel like, you know, I have to run out, I'm like, man, I'm out of meat. I got to go run out and buy, you know, the first $10 a pound ground beef that I find. And then just having an idea of where, what stores have what deals at any given time. So Costco, like I don't really buy much of my meat, but if I really need uh, meat and I need it quick, they have grass fed, hundred percent grass fed frozen burger patties with just beef as the ingredients that are under $5 a pound. And that's constant, always. Um, I try not to buy that consistently, but in a pinch, that'll work. Um, so that that's the main hack, I think, is just having a plan um, and pretty much always knowing where you're at, what you have in the freezer, and what you need to stock up for and when you need to to keep an eye out for, for sales that are going to happen. I, I want to, I'm, I'm in a hundred percent agreement, you know, uh, that chest freezer is the biggest thing, oh. thing the best tool of them all. Um, but I think there's some good tips here, you know, exploit the fast food, you know, exploit the sales, you know, figure out, you know, Costco is good for certain things, you know, Greek yogurt, eggs, right. Maybe not the greatest for meat. Usually those supermarkets are better for meat and you can get really cheap, meat like ground meat on sale freeze it i love that recommendation you get some organ meat you know those some of those really inexpensive roasts you can throw in a slow cooker and they come out great just a little bit of spicing uh spices and um you know those those are you know pretty damn good uh they're getting the frozen vegetables frozen fruits if if you know or buying it bulk from costco the fresh you know fresh uh, berries that they have there uh, all good tips, you know, absolutely. And get that chest freezer. Um, I got another another quick question. Can you tell me a little bit about, so you came from, you were educated sort of in that sports medicine, sports field. So, you know, low carb, 
wasn't a thing there, right? It's not, you're not taught that. It's energy balance. You're taught about calories, you know, at, you know, before on the air, uh, we were, you know, uh, we were just talking and uh, off the air, sorry. And you were talking about how uh, you were in, you know, pretty good shape. You talked about your athletics and what, what happened, right? What happened sort of after that? You know, because you had your own sort of like metabolic unwellness and then reclaiming journey. So I wanted to get a sense of, you know, I mean, you were educated, you're like in sports medicine, that's your bachelor's, you know, you're you're clearly interested in, in athletics and, and, you know, calories out is not a problem for you, right? So what, <laughs> where did it all go wrong? Uh, so... My 20s was college athletics. I played college baseball while getting my bachelor's. Um, it was coaching and athletics. It was personal training, um, very amateur, amateur bodybuilding. And so the, like, the majority of my 20s, I was in you know, what I would consider pretty good shape. And then, you know, got married, you know, had a, a fairly stressful long hour job and then had two little kids. And so the combination of working, you know, 50 hours a week with complete opposite schedules of my wife, like, you know, my days off were Monday, Tuesday, and her days off were Friday, Saturday. And, you know, so literally all of our entire life was just passing kids back and forth on who was going to watch them. And, you know, I, I made a decision to you know, prioritize spending time with family and instead of working out and the, you know, byproduct of that was I started to eat a little eh, questionable and that's not an excuse. Like that's what did that look like? Yeah. What, so, so what is questionable eating for somebody who's highly sort of fitness oriented and amateur bodybuilding? Like, what does that look like? You know, so, like, so that for me was, what did it go to, you know, I would, I would still meal prep. Like I would still take my meals um, to work. Uh, I didn't eat out very often just cause I was, you know, growing up in that space. That's something that's kind of like morally opposed is spending extra money and eating out all the time. So I'd still take my meals to work, which were, you know, fairly healthy. I was still, you know, decent bro science diet like chicken rice chicken veggies lean ground turkey um 93 7 ground beef all that kind of stuff uh but i didn't really have any holds on drinking or snacking right i didn't drink a lot but you know i drink a couple nights a week or you know snacking chips you know during the day cookies at night like maybe we made something uh you know, a pasta dish or something for dinner one of the nights. And it was just like that. It wasn't even, you know, it wasn't going through some, you know, terrible relationship with food where I started eating terrible. So um, you're very structured, you're amateur bodybuilding. I mean, you're lean. You probably have a good handle of your appetite, your meal prepping. And then you just let off the dial just a little bit. Yeah. Let off the dial just a little bit. And what happened? Uh, over the course of about three years, I gained about probably about 25 pounds, 20 pounds. So about 10 pounds a year. Yeah. Which, you know, is pretty standard. Like if you, th if you break it down to, I gained a pound a, a month, you're like, okay, that, that's pretty like normal considering, you know, there's a lot of people who gain a whole lot more. And, you know, in the back of my head, it was, I didn't like it. Right. Like I spent a lot of my twenties looking a certain way. And now all of a sudden I'm not looking that way. Um, but in my head, I was like, I don't have time to work out. So there's no point in doing the diet thing. Like that just sucks. So I'm just going to like continue to do what I'm doing. And then we moved. Um, but did and... you really think about it? Like, Hmm, what should I do about this? Or was it just like, you went on with your life, you know, I, like... at first I just went on with my life. Like, you know, I use you're the excuse. Like, you're not like, screw it. I'm going to eat all the beer and chips that I want. It's just more like, you know what? I'm not going to live this strict bodybuilding life that I was at before. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, you know, we moved, you know, quite a, quite a big move. So that was a nice reset. 
And I was like, all right, you know, I got to, I got to start a home gym. So I at least have something, you know, to do and I can get back in shape. And honestly, I didn't start on low carb. Um, I started on whole 30, which I had done in the past and I lost weight, but I felt terrible. Like, and when I mean terrible, like every time I ate, I was bloated. Um, you know, I felt lethargic throughout the day. I didn't have good energy. I went 90 days of being as strict as you can possibly be only whole, whole foods, lower fat foods, lean meats, no alcohol, um, and started to lose some weight, but I'm like, man, like this, this blows. Like, I'm like, I just did 90 days of this and I, I probably feel worse than I did before from a physical standpoint. So that's dumb. I'm just going to give up on this and then just put the weight right back on in, you know, two months. And then a Vegas trip for an anniversary was the final straw where I'm like, all right, I got to figure out something. And my wife sent me Paul Saladino's profile. And, you know, regardless of what people think about Paul Saladino and his stance on carbs, or he's one of the largest and most polarizing figures out there. And my wife's like, he's a little kooky, but just check him out. I'm like, okay. So what you're saying is I can eat so fatty your wife, meat. Your wife's like also into the fitness space then, right? Yeah. Coming across Paul Saladino. Yeah. So my wife and I actually did this. This is the life that I lived leading up. Um, my wife and I both did an amateur show uh, two weeks before our wedding. So my wife planned the wedding, prepared for a show, did the show, did the wedding, worked, and all of that, you know, all at the same time. So, yes. So she, she is into that. Um, so she sends me his stuff, and I'm like, I'm in from a physiological standpoint, I can get behind that. I mean, I don't have to eat veggies. Cool. And so I immediately, you know, started into that, started feeling great. Um, and then it kind of just one thing led to another. I wasn't bloated anymore. Started having a little bit more energy. So I started working out more. So I started sleeping better. So I had even more energy and I just kind of spiraled all down. And then I finally, at the beginning of the year, I felt good about you know, my physique progress. And I was like, all right, let's, let's go a little stricter, you know, let's go strict into animal based where I'm still prioritizing meat, but I'm still, you know, under 50 grams of carbs a day. And then that was the entirety of, of 2023. Um, and I've recently moved over to practically a zero carb. Like somebody out there is going to go, there's trace amount of carbs in eggs, but from a nutritional label standpoint, there are zero carbs on the, the food that I eat. Okay. So, so, and what happened to your weight over those two years? So, um, you mean once I started animal based? Yeah. I mean, you're doing whole 30, you lose a little bit of weight and it sucks. And what happens next? Yeah. So I, I lose a little bit of weight, gained it right back. Um, my highest was the, the before and after I've shared is my highest was 215 in September of 23. So a little over or 22. So, almost a year and a half ago. So I was 215, uh, April of 23. So this last April I was 180 and 180 is a little bit, that's a little lean for me. That's like me trying to actively get as lean as I can. But, you know, over the course of eight what months, your, I lost your competition weight. Uh, my last show was 170 was my competition weight. So you were like 10 pounds above competition weight. Yeah. Which okay. it's not super comfortable. Like it wasn't hardcore, but that's like no, it's really not strict. It's and... that weight, you know, like I, I, you're, you know, within 10 pounds of competition weight, that's it's, it's a hungry place. Yes. Yeah. So that was April. Um, since then I've kind of, you know, gone back to the little bit of the, you know, the bodybuilding trajectory where I ramped everything up to try and gain some weight back on. Um, and build some muscle peaked back out at about 205 in September again, but at a much different, um, look, right? Like a 10 pound difference, but I looked a, a ton different. And then currently since then I've been working slowly down, which has been hard for me because I'm used to the, the bro science crash diet. I'm losing 30 pounds in, you know, 10 weeks and I'm getting show ready. But slowly been losing down, and I'm I'm currently right about 190. And you feel good there? I feel great. Any yeah. other, you know, I'm just curious, any other things you noticed? So so you found your energy went up, you found you're full, you found you don't really have to struggle, you're not bloated, 
And that's what makes you keep to this way of eating. Yeah. And so what keeps me even more is when I finally decided to kick the carbs completely um, and go full carnivore because for most of my life, I've had to, you know, I've never had problems with blood sugar or anything like that, but I've had to at least plan out my food, um, especially if I'm being active because I didn't want to get into a situation where, you know, I felt hypoglycemic and I felt like I needed to eat or I was going to start getting shaky and my performance was going to go down and all that. So it's been very much a part of my life to plan out meals. And I was finally to the point, I was like, God, I wonder if I can kick this and I wonder what's going to happen because I always kept the carbs because I was afraid of that. I would do like one to two days of no carb and I would start to feel that way. And so I would add the carbs, carbs back in. And so I finally kicked the carbs completely. And that piece of my life has completely gone away. Like I can, I'm, I've never been a one or two meal a day guy. I'm two meals a day right now. And I can legitimately eat in the morning and then not have to worry about when I'm going to eat again. And if it's eight hours from now and I go out and I'm out and about the whole time, it's totally fine. And so it's been, that's been liberating because I don't have to worry about where I'm going to get food. I have to worry about like stopping somewhere to get food because I feel like I'm going to you know, start to get, you know, shaky and weak. So it's, that's, what's been keeping me on, on lately. I, you know, reminds me of my discussion with Rob Sykes, who's talked about sort of, you know, the eating disorders that can be seen in the uh, sort of bodybuilding world, the gym bro world, uh, a lot of disordered eating. And, and it's really because nobody's fat adapted, right? And when you're not fat adapted and you're, you know, you want you need that frequent meals because you're just living this roller coaster and you're in a truly low energy state. I mean, it is a very difficult place to be. And so you walk out of that and it sounds like you have PTSD from like being hypocaloric, right? And low energy, right? Like your your brain is just you're like <laughs> you know, you can't even think about going a long time without eating. And it's funny if you go to the extreme sort of obesity, severe obesity space, it's the same mindset, right? Because that those blood sugars are are from metabolic syndrome and 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 from uh, um you know pre-diabetes are now fluctuating. So the brain is hungry, almost like the same mechanism, those those fluctuations. And uh and it's so it sounds like really the food relation you say the food relationship wasn't a big thing, but here you are saying I feel good. I don't need to be like, I don't have to sit and prep every little thing. So I, and eat in a way that I need to plan my meals to feel good. I could just eat one meal and, or, you know, one or two meals a day and I'm fine. I don't even have to think about what to do. So there's a freedom you have here that you didn't have before. And it's probably from fat adaption. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. You know? That's yeah, that's one hundred percent what I would attribute to it, and I always kept myself from that by hanging on to those few carbs because I was convinced I had to. Um, and I would actually like when I first got into the space, I would actually go like this with carnivores over carbs. And I'm like, yeah, like at the end of the day, like a little bit of carbs is not going to kill you. Like that's not what the issue is here. And so I, I would go like this all the time, and every time I would try to like give up carbs a little bit. And again, when I, when I tell people carbs, like we're talking like 50 grams, which on a grand scale is still very low carb. Yeah. You, you f the fat adaption you feel when you force your body to really adapt, it's, a, it's different. Somewhat low carb to very, very low carb is different, especially when you're an athlete. So, and it can be terrible. That transition period can be terrible. The first week, two weeks, three weeks. If you're not up on salt, if you're not eating enough, I mean, somebody like you who probably doesn't eat enough generally, right? Like you probably struggle to get, gain muscle because you probably don't eat. Like, do you struggle to gain muscle or I'm just curious. You know? that, that's been a, that's been a thing in my life. Um, so if I were, I always tell people if I was to just let my body be its genetic self, I'd probably be about 5'10 and 145, 150. Yeah, that, I I could have guessed that, right? I could have guessed that you you like you have to eat to put on muscle, and so 
you know, um, you know, it's very interesting. So the, the, uh, you know, the bottom line is, uh, it, it sounds like being fat adapted is giving you peace. And that's what a lot of people feel. And it's, you're right. It's not about that little amount of carbohydrates that it's not that little amount of carbohydrates is nothing. It's what does fat adaption give you? What does stable glycemia give you? What does feeling like you're energetic and in control give you? Right. And so I'm with you. It's like, you know, my kids eat fruit just like yours do. Right. I don't like, they don't, they don't necessarily need to do what I do. But uh, the reasons why I do things are very concrete and, and uh, they benefit me. You know, I think the world that you came from probably, I mean, I bet you talk to the, some of your friends from that world and they're like, you're doing what? You know, like, I mean, what's been the reaction? I'm curious from. Uh... Oh, so what's funny is, um, so I actually listened to your your discussion with Ox, right? On calories. Yeah. Um because Ox is actually, he actually follows me. Like I actually interact with Ox every once in a while. And he's like, you're legit the only carnivore I can stand. Um, because I, like, I understand his world and I understand, you know, both sides of it. And, you know, it, it is kind of funny because, you know, that side of it definitely does have that opinion of, well, did you can't do what you're trying to do without carbs? Like you, you just can't do it. If, if what you were doing is the most effective way to build muscle, then you would see a whole bunch of bodybuilders do it. Right. Like that's, you, you've heard it, you know, that's the, that, that was most of the conversation you had with him, um, you know, about the calories in calories out. And what, you know, my response to that is now that I'm finally at a place where I've gone completely, nobody who thinks they feel good, right. Cause all, all these guys feel good. I thought I felt good, you know, back in my twenties when I was working out and, and in good shape, you know, I now realized that I still had some lethargy every time I ate, I you know, had bloating. It was the, you know, the typical gym bro where it's like you wake up first thing in the morning and you take your progress pick because you're going to look like you're 20 pounds heavier the moment you, you know, sniff coffee or something. And so, you know, I, I had all of this, you know, the stuff and I think I'm feeling pretty good. So when you tell me that there's a chance that I could go through a week or two of like keto flu, like why on earth would I try that? Like, absolutely not. And that's why I didn't, right? I had no interest in going through the potential issues of carb withdrawal or trying to become fat adapted. Most people don't want to change. And when you need to go six weeks to experience something, most people won't do that. I mean, I don't blame them. You know, I don't like the common response is I don't feel good with carbohydrates. And I'm like, yes, you know, without carbohydrates. Yes. You will not feel good, especially if you're an athlete. I would never take an athlete on season and put them on a low carb. Off season, different story. You know, and uh, the problem is, so, you know, it hit me actually in that interview and you bring it up that, you know, for the longest time I've been fighting, um, I've been fighting against people just not understanding. And I've come to a point in my career based on my, you know, whatever, like achievements, whatever you want to call it, that I have to realize that most people will not know what I know. Just having gone through, like, forget about scientifically, right? Just experiencing severe obesity and then not, right? Most people won't know what it's like just talking to hundreds of people like you and like the guy you helped with, uh, you know, eating sort of uh, the way he's eating, you know, the, this gentleman with cerebral palsy, most people just don't have that experience. And all they have is like reading online about like these hormones, like we just talked about, you know, like, you know, some hormones that we, we just happened to mention them. And it's like, you know, people just read about these hormones right? They will never like ask somebody how they feel when this hormone is high, when the hormone is low, when they, they, they won't understand what it means, right? It's sort of like, uh, you know, people talk about calories. We've never like, can't really measure. It's just like a guide. It's like a loose guide. There's so much more to it, you know, 
forget about not even being able to measure it. You can have intra, like, like a huge amount of variability person to person, right? So, so the thing is, is we're talking about immeasurable things. Now, what does that world have going for it, right? We're talking about something that, that really is very complicated. And it hit me that most people will never understand. He doesn't know what it's like to go through keto flu. He doesn't know what it's like to be fat adapted. He may never know. You may be crazy to him. You're like, I feel energy, right? I feel no le less lethargy. I don't feel bloated. He's like, you do you, man. Like that's the that's <laughs> standard gym bro response, right? And then that's the standard response from medicine. It's like, you do whatever works. It's pretty, ch it's a cheap, in my opinion. It's a, it's a lazy way of thinking, right? Because it's not really curious as to why that works for the individual, right? Why does this work for you, you know? Um, but- my, it hit me that it's just most people won't have that experience, right? Like like most people, if you go back to that gym bro world that you and your your wife were more part of, if you go to them and you say, you know, my life is completely different. I don't think anybody there will say anything different than I'm glad it works for you. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's 100% true because in their minds and this this has been like my biggest, when I first started my account, I didn't really know what I was trying to do, right? Like I was just, you know, I'm on carnivore. It's great. I'm just going to post about it. But what I realized is the vast majority of people, it's exactly what you said. The vast majority of these people, they don't even know that they don't feel good, right? Like how, how normal is it to joke about needing stretchy pants after Thanksgiving? Like, oh, gotta get my stretchy pants. That's not normal. Like that is not normal, you know? And so when I tell somebody, I'm like, okay, you eat your Thanksgiving dinner. And I eat Thanksgiving, right? I'm not, I'm not telling anybody not to eat Thanksgiving, but I'm just using an example. You eat that. And then you feel like you need, you know, to loosen four belt sizes because of what you ate. I'll go eat two and a half pounds of ribeye and feel like nothing changed at all. And they're like, well, that's, that's not possible. Right. That's that doesn't work that way. You're not telling the, you know, they might not come out and say it, but in their minds, they're like, that's not real life. And that that is, that's that that gym bro. Yeah, whatever works for you. Cool. Like, man, if you guys so my thought is always, what if we finally convince? And I and some people are finally starting to do it. Um, there's a decathlete for the US team that got third in the Pan Am games who's carnivore. And, and they don't have to be carnivore, just low carb in general. Um, and so there's more and more athletes that are realizing, because I don't feel like any of my performance has gone down at all. You know, I'm not a high level athlete. I don't go out and do a whole lot of stuff, but I'm active. I lift. Um, I don't feel like anything's changed from a performance standpoint by removing carbs, except for the fact that I can go work out fasted now. Like I woke up this morning and was like nine o'clock in the morning. I'm going to go work out, haven't eaten yet, no big deal, right? Whereas before I'm, you know, eating my oatmeal with protein powder as I'm walking onto the gym floor because I'm terrified of running out of an energy source before I get to the end of my workout because if that happens, like I got to sit down and stuff my face and kick my feet up for the next 45 minutes because I'm in a bad spot. And so I, I always wonder if we could actually convince people to do it how many people would would do that? And then you could truly compare, you know, a performance standpoint, because if you take athletes, like you said, in season, you know, all of the studies that have been done carbs versus low carb, you take somebody who's on their standard diet, you cut their carbs, and then you say, go perform. They're going to have terrible performance. Nobody is going to perform better that way. But what if we were actually able to get people to fat adapt, like you were saying, transition, and then a month or two later, have that same that that would be interesting to me. And I think something like that would finally start to get people to realize. But until we, then. We have that. I mean, Andrew Kutnick and Philip Prince with Tim Noakes, they did the studies. I mean, they basically showed we don't even have the tip of the iceberg with fat oxidation. They recorded the highest fat oxidation ever recorded a couple months back. And this was with Andrew Kutnick as well. Uh, and they did a, you know, a comparison of, you know, the keto brick versus a, a, you know, 
calorie equated other, you know, energy bar and they found no difference. So basically, likely the only benefit of carbohydrates is preventing hypoglycemia. That's it. So if you can prevent hypoglycemia with another dietary strategy, you know, you don't really need, you, you don't really need to, you don't need the carbohydrate. I think for all intents and purposes, if you're a professional athlete listening to this, you know, talk to your personal dietitian, right? You know, you don't like, but if you're the 99.5% of everybody else, you know, you don't need carbohydrate. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Carnivore JT, Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, can you tell people, you know, where they can find you if they want to interact with you and uh, tell people where they can find you? Yeah. So uh have a website, theinnercarnivore.com. Uh, also the title of my podcast. I'm on social media, every social media platform, um, Carnivore JT. Uh, the Twitter one has a little underscore in it, uh, carnivore underscore JT. Uh, yeah, but I'm on uh, Facebook, Instagram. I try and check all of them as much as possible. Uh, Instagram and, and Twitter or X now are the two that I'm most active on. Um, but also YouTube, TikTok, which I dislike, but it's a platform. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a pleasure and I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, thank you. 